Good evening. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 28th Kenneth Meyer Lecture, generously supported by the Meyer Foundation. My name is Murray Louise Ayres and I'm privileged to be the Director General of the National Library of Australia. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the elders, families and descendants of the Wurundjeri people who have been and are the custodians of these lands. We acknowledge that the land on which we meet was the place of age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the local Aboriginal peoples have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of these lands. I'm delighted that we're here tonight in the Kenneth Meyer building to present the 2017 Kenneth Meyer Lecture. It's wonderful to be in a place that resonates so strongly with Kenneth Meyer and with other members of the Meyer family. The Kenneth Meyer Lecture began in 1990 as a major annual event for the Friends of the National Library of Australia. The lecture was named for Kenneth Badiou Meyer, AC, Chairman of the National Library Council from 1974 to 1982 and a long time friend of the library. Kenneth Meyer was a visionary Australian philanthropist and businessman. He contributed to an extensive range of institutions and causes through significant personal donations, enthusiastic participation on boards and his involvement in the Sydney Meyer Fund and the Meyer Foundation. And I'm so thrilled to know that that's not my telephone. So <laughs> I was just saying I've had that happen once before from this position. <laughs> A generous supporter of the National Library of Australia, Meyer was a founding member of the National Library's Council in 1961, prior to serving as its chairman from 1974 to 1982. So I think you can see how long that association was. In 1989, he was the recipient of the Australian Library and Information Association Redmond Barry Award for his service to libraries. For 28 years, the Kenneth Meyer Lecture at the National Library of Australia has provided eminent Australians with a forum to speak their minds and contribute to national debates. The lecture has been presented by a whole panoply of thought leaders, from the Honourable Gough Whitlam to Professor Fiona Stanley, and most recently, former Australian of the Year, Professor Mick Dodson, and arts and media champion, Mr Kim Williams. This lecture series would not be possible without the support of Kenneth Meyer himself, the Meyer family, and since 2015, the Meyer Foundation. So on behalf of my colleagues and, and of you who get to hear this lecture, I offer heartfelt thanks to the directors of the Meyer Foundation and the president, Mr. Martin Meyer and Mrs. Louise Meyer, who are here tonight for the foundation's <laughs> continuing support of the lecture. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne Summers to deliver the 2017 Kenneth Meyer Lecture. Anne is a best-selling author, journalist and thought leader who has had a long career in politics, the media, business and the non-government sector. She's the author of eight books, including the classic Damned Whores and God's Police, first published in 1975. She's been editor-in-chief of Ms the landmark US feminist magazine, and her 1988 purchase of Ms and Sassy magazines with business partner Sandra Yates remains one of only two women-led management buyouts in US corporate history. Her professional life has seen her run the Office for the Status of Women, now the Office for Women, during the Hawke government, and she also advised former Prime Minister Paul Keating on women's and other issues in the lead up to the 1993 election, on matters of gender equality, social responsibility and social justice, and Summers' articulate journalism, politics and activism call us all to account. Um, I'm very uh, thrilled to say that the National Library is the custodian of Anne's papers, and in fact, a whole troop of elves are going to be busy next week, um, packing up the next tranche to bring to the library. So Anne's career will be um, documented in meticulous detail for generations to come. So please welcome Dr Anne Summers to present the 2017 Kenneth Meyer Lecture titled 2020 Vision, Where is Australia Headed? 
Well, good evening, everybody. It's um, wonderful to be here in Melbourne and in this building uh, and uh, with the opportunity to share with you some of my ideas, um, which this lecture um, generously provides an opportunity to, to do. So Dr. Marie Louise Ayres, Martin and Louise Meyer, uh, other distinguished guests, and men and women of Melbourne. Um, I'm very honoured to be here delivering the, the Kenneth Meyer lecture. And in honouring Ken Meyer's um, memory, I want to acknowledge his love for the institution uh, where I delivered the, this lecture some weeks ago, um, and where the lecture is always delivered first and then in Melbourne later, and that is the National Library of Australia. And uh, which, of course, is one of tonight's sponsors as well. His love um, for the library was manifested in practical ways, including financial, that among other things, provided funding for this annual lecture. In sharing some thoughts with you tonight, I want to pay tribute to the kind of philanthropy that fosters ideas, because tonight I will be talking about ideas. All philanthropy is important and, of course, welcome. But donating to a hospital or an animal conservancy does not carry with it the risks inherent in making funds available to foster ideas. But it is, you never know where ideas are going to take you. But it is ideas this country currently and urgently needs. And just as importantly, we need guidance on how to turn these ideas into the kind of changes this country so desperately needs. And that is what I'm going to talk about this evening. Before I do so, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, we are meeting on, the Wurundjeri people. I acknowledge and respect their elders and families, their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. I also acknowledge and welcome the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending this evening's event. I'd also want to express my support for Makarata, the process that would formally ensure the voices of Australia's First Nations are included in our constitution as outlined in the recent Uluru Statement from the Heart. What I would like to lay out for your consideration this evening is the idea that Australia is in need of reconstruction. I'm calling it New Century Reconstruction. Now, reconstruction is something we have undergone before, so it is not an alien concept, even, it, even if it is more than seven decades since we last attempted it. There are parallels between the Australia that decided to plan its post-war reconstruction and Australia today. In 1942, the government established a post-war reconstruction ministry. As described by the Melbourne historian Stuart McIntyre, and I'm quoting, its function encompassed the preparation of plans for the transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy, along with a collaborative role in re-establishment of members of the services and war workers, the disposal of wartime buildings, plant and equipment, the maintenance and expansion of employment and the national income, the prevention of want and attainment of social security, and the development and conservation of the country's resources. Now, in 2017, we need, in my view, to prepare plans for the transition from the analogue to the digital economy, from the manufacturing to the services economy, from the no-tech to the very high-tech, along with the, a collaborative role in the re-establishment of workers from displaced, disrupted or superseded industries, the disposal of the old economy, mines, plant and equipment, the maintenance and expansion of the national income and the design of post-employment occupations for the population, the prevention of want and the restoration of social security, the development and conservation of the nation's resources, physical, natural and human. And uh, perhaps you'll agree with me that the challenges from 1942 to 2017 are remarkably similar. I will expand on this idea later in my remarks but for now, I just want to note that what I have in mind is a larger and even more encompassing project than the post-war reconstruction that was undertaken in the 1940s. In the 2020s, we will need not just economic and social reconstruction, we will also need emotional and even spiritual reconstruction. 
We will need to rebuild our society to equip ourselves for the challenges of the future and to address the failures of the present. And in order to do this, we need to be emotionally and physically strong. We need to be up for what we have to do. When I decided to call this lecture 2020 Vision, I was thinking of a timetable. I was thinking not so much of a deadline, an end date, as a starting date for the new century reconstruction. This is less than three years away. It's urgent. But as well as a timetable, 2020 Vision describes something else. It's a measure of vision. When we visit the optometrist and have our eyesight measured according to the Snellen chart, if we're lucky enough to have 2020 vision, we are considered normal. We do not need corrective glasses or contact lenses. We need such a test for our country as well. Not just to test our national vision, although it's a pity it's not possible to do that, but to measure what kind of corrections that overall as a country we need. As I will argue for the remainder of this lecture, I am of the view that we are in need of severe correction. If we were a person, we might well be considered legally blind. <laughs> we have no idea what sort of country we want to be. Unless we take urgent action, we will be entering the third decade of the 21st century directionless and unfocused in a world that is in chaos today and likely to remain so. This is why I'm advocating new century reconstruction. First, let's look at what's wrong with the way things are. Let me summarise. The benefits and the burdens of our society are unfairly distributed. As individuals, we lack agency to change this. And we have no plan to make Australia fairer or more efficient. We lack the policies to guide us. Our political leaders are inept and our institutions, for the most part, are incapable or prevented from serving us in the way that is needed. If that sounds a bit harsh, let us consider the following. Australia does not have a clear economic policy. Now, we have an economic record and a very strong one. We are, as Donald Horne pointed out in the 1960s, a lucky country. In fact, we are unbelievably lucky in that our winning streak has lasted so long. Our living standards and well-being are generally high, the OECD noted in its most recent survey of the Australian economy, although it cautioned that, I quote, challenges remain in gender gaps and in greenhouse gas emissions, and further challenges arise from population ageing. Further challenges lie in our ongoing inability to manage microeconomic policy, for instance, budget policy and institutional reform. In other important areas, we have no discernible policy at all. Note, I'm only going to refer to domestic policy in these remarks. I can only hope that we're better served when it comes to defence and foreign affairs, particularly in these currently extremely perilous times. Let's look at some of the domestic policies. We have no employment policy. We have various strategies for creating jobs for people in situations such as leaving prison, transitioning from welfare or leaving school, but I'm unaware of an overriding policy that addresses unemployment, underemployment, threats to employment from global outsourcing, declining industries, hello coal, let alone robotics, artificial intelligence and other instances of digital disruption. Even before we factor in this looming impact of the digital economy, we have performed poorly. We have averaged an unemployment rate of 6.9% since the late, 1960s, late 1970s. We have massive underutilisation of our workforce, especially of women. With women making up 71.6% of all part-time employees, we have the third highest rate of female part-time employment in the OECD. 25% of women in Australia work part-time as against the OECD average of 16%. If we um, drill down further into, unemployment, sorry, into employment, unemployment and underemployment by region, by age, by population group, especially by in, uh, with Indigenous Australians, the picture is even bleaker. All of this underutilisation has consequences for individual financial wellbeing and for national GDP. We have no population policy and we exhibit a marked reluctance to adopt one. It is literally the policy that dare not speak its name. We don't want to have a conversation about a big Australia 
versus a sustainable Australia because it's a fight, not a discussion, and we seem unable to reconcile the two sides. Our fertility rate, which is births per woman, remains stubbornly below replacement levels and nothing will change that. The Howard government's baby bonus, together with Treasurer Peter Costello's exhortation in 2004 to women to have one for mum, one for dad and one for the family, did produce a 15-year high fertility rate of 1.90 by 2006, but it lasted just six years and has not returned to those levels since. It is currently 1.77, which a visiting Canadian commentator in 2016 said puts us in a demographic death spiral. We rely on immigration to grow our population and to keep it younger than otherwise would be. But this is an inconvenient truth in an environment where immigration levels are a volatile political issue. The mass movement of people across and within borders is one of the biggest issues of our time. It is a confronting and complex matter involving millions of people moving from their homes to other peoples in the process causing resentment, anger and pushback. And I'm just talking about tourism. <laughs> in recent years, towns in Italy and in Spain have taken steps to limit the number of tourists who descend on them each summer, putting pressure on local facilities, pushing up housing costs, creating crowding and inconvenience that is not always sufficiently compensated for by the tourist dollar. This problem is perhaps most evident in Venice, where each year 20 million tourists invade this city of just 50,000 residents. Each day, thousands of people are disgorged from enormous cruise liners to roam the narrow streets and canals, gawking at famous sites, snapping selfies in front of iconic landmarks, then returning to their boats for their prepaid meals. A large number of these tourists are just day trippers, so they contribute nothing to the hotel economy, but they are wreaking huge damage on the fragile ecosystem of this marvellous city. San Sebastian in northern Spain is another town that is pulling up the welcome sign as tourism becomes a burden rather than a bounty. Tourists are now confronted with signs such as, tourist, you are the terrorist, or tourists go home, refugees welcome. <laughs> now this particular sign of course highlights the other mass movement of people into Europe, the flood of refugees and asylum seekers from Africa and the Middle East. This has become a political nightmare for most countries of Europe. Immigration is a tinderbox issue in France, Belgium, Germany and the Scandinavian countries and there is a pronounced absence of political solutions. And speaking of immigration, what is our immigration policy? It is another of those dare not speak its name areas. Net overseas migration now accounts for 55% of our population growth but we don't mention that in public. Immigration policy has been conflated and confused with refugee policy and our political leaders have seemingly encouraged this by subsuming immigration within the Department for Border Protection. Now with the proposed, or I think it actually has just happened, hasn't it, this week, uh, Department of Homeland Security about to swallow up that department, immigration will perhaps only be viewed via a border protection and security lens. How will this affect our population's growth and age if we lose sight of the demographic imperatives of continued immigration? I could go through any, other num any number of policy deficits. What is our cyber policy, our cultural policy, our energy policy, our digital policy, our incomes and wages policy, our housing policy, our retirement incomes policy, our welfare policy, our industry policy, our environment policy. There are undoubtedly many other areas and issues where spending and other decisions are made without the benefit of an overarching policy. Instead, decisions are taken on an ad hoc basis, perhaps influenced by ideological conviction, budget constraint or lobbying, rather than driven by articulated, well-argued and publicly available policy. Now the absence of policy means reduced accountability because there are no benchmarks or goals against which activity can be measured. Absence of policy also means that government occurs within a vacuum rather than, win an, rather than within an electorally endorsed framework 
that defines our national aspirations and priorities. Now, while I'm quite confident that our political leaders are sincere when they say they are governing in the national interest, I wonder them if any of them could tell us what the national interest actually is. At the same time, we voters have reduced agency. We have little or no power to even confirm, let alone decide what country we want to be and how we're going to get there. At election time, when political parties seek a mandate to govern on our behalf, the recent tendency is for political leaders to speak in slogans. We get to decide our future on the basis of a catchy phrase, a string of words. We vote for nouns, jobs and growth, border protection, debt and deficit, whatever they might mean. As voters, we have not endorsed a direction, let alone a policy, and most of us have no power at all. Most of us live in safe seats and are therefore totally ignored by the political parties. They put all their efforts into wooing those in seats where a change of mind by a few hundred or even a few dozen could determine an election result. Elsewhere in the world, we have seen the votes of a, mon a minority of the population deliver calamitous outcomes. I'm thinking of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump as the President of the United States. Our system has seen parties winning government without winning a majority of votes. And we know that senators can be elected with just a handful of primary votes. But in the House of Representatives, we are at least protected against a small minority determining who sits on the treasury benches. However, as citizens, we have no influence on who is nominated for pre-selection by our parties. We have no redress if we feel that those who are nominated and who sit in the parliament are increasingly unrepresentative of popular opinion on contentious issues such as climate change, same-sex marriage or abortion. If we feel politically marooned, all we can do is protest, seek out third-party candidates, join in the wave of so-called populism. Once in power, our governments are becoming less accountable by being less transparent. There are a number of disturbing examples of this. A great deal of policy is now outsourced. The beneficiaries of this practice, including the big accounting firms, the, the accounting firms, especially the so-called big four, they have seen their expansion into government consultancy bring in lucrative returns. In the past three years, these four companies have been paid $1 billion to do work that was once done in the public service. Senator Nick Xenophon has called for public disclosure of the details of the, pub, of the policy work done under these contracts. It seems extraordinary that this is not public information. Now, while our democracy is not challenged or overtly threatened in the same ways as is happening such as in countries such as Turkey or the United States, we should still be worried about unaccountable and possibly corrupt practices. We do have the covert subversion of democratic processes where governments are influenced in their decision making by the efforts of lobbyists for special interests. Often, perhaps more than we realise, these influences are not disclosed. Sometimes they are even disguised so that the opposition, the media, the electorate, and I suspect even the government is not always aware of who is pushing for particular outcomes. They are not open to any kind of scrutiny and therefore none of us are any the wiser when a particular decision may have resulted from what lobbyists like to brag about as fingerprintless campaigns. Also of great concern should be recent examples of ministers going straight from the cabinet room to post-parliamentary employment with companies directly affected by their former portfolios. Andrew Robb, the trade minister in the last government, took an 800000 a year job with a Chinese trade company days after the 2016 election. And just a couple of weeks ago, it was revealed that Bruce Bilson, the Minister for Small Business until the 2016 election, was actually on the payroll of his future employer, the franchise lobby, while still sitting at the cabinet table. It's time to change all this. I think we can learn quite a lot about how to approach this massive project from the post-war reconstruction model and the people who made it happen. There are three ways in which it is still a relevant model, despite the lapse of more than 70 years. 
First, it was a set of policies based on values. The values drove the approach and led to the creation of institutions such as the Commonwealth Employment Service, funding for housing, hospitals and universities, social security benefits and the insistence on economic planning for the betterment of the population. H.C. Uh, Coombs, known always as Nugget Coombs, who in early 1943, the age of 37, was put in charge of the Ministry of Post-War Reconstruction, described his brief in the following terms. Widening opportunity for all was to be the criterion by which policies were judged. The task was to ensure an economic and social context in which positive opportunities were present rather than merely the absence of constraints. Freedom is opportunity might have been the watchword. The program was, he wrote in his autobiography, Trial Balance, an instrument of social change. Second, the people who staffed the ministry were exemplars of the then new model for public service, professional and idealistic. They were led by Nugget Coombs, who was one of the most outstanding people this country has ever produced. He shaped Australia in ways that are almost beyond measure in the policies and practices and institutions so ranging, ranging from um, the Reserve Bank to um, the Department of Re Postal Reconstruction, um, the Institute of Aboriginal Affairs, the Australian Council for the Arts and so many other institutions. And in the many people across more than one generation, he befriended, advised and guided. Ken Meyer was one of these. Ken sought out Nugget for advice and what today we would call mentoring. He was influenced by Coombe's belief that wealth ought to be more equally distributed and that people in commerce and industry had a responsibility to financially support the arts. The two met frequently starting in the 1960s and continuing until Ken's untimely death in Alaska in 1992. Ken's son, Michael Meyer, was an avid listener to many of their conversations. He has said that Coombs, quote, expanded Dad's universe and made him more politically aware. Nugget also delivered the second Kenneth Meyer lecture in 1991, uh, after the first, of course, delivered by Gough Whitlam. Now, today's issues are both similar and different, although the magnitude of the, magnitude of the reconstruction task is comparable. We need the kind of dedicated and visionary people who are committed to public service and to the betterment of Australia to carry out the new century reconstruction. We have plenty of such people, but they need to be encouraged and empowered. They will also be different from the men of the 1940s. They were all white, mostly Anglo, and although they were progressive for their times, today's policy architects would both be more diverse themselves and would take into account a broader range of social and personal issues than was seen as necessary back then. Coombs and his generation saw the need to encourage wide-scale immigration, although this initially was only from Europe. The White Australia policy was still in place. They also recognised the need to deliver justice and empowerment to Australian Aborigines, and indeed sought the extension of Commonwealth powers to do this and many other uh, reforms in the referendum of 1944 that was rejected. But that generation was blind to women's equality. Although women were employed in the ministry, including in some senior economic roles, they did not receive the same recognition, nor probably the same pay, as the men whose names are forever associated with this era. In those days, when women were asked for advice, it was only on women's issues. For instance, during the panic about the declining birth rate, Dame Enid Lyons and Lady Salento were asked in 1944 by the Director General of Health, who was working in concert with post-war reconstruction, to report on childbearing. Today, we would expect expertise to exist across gender lines. A new century reconstruction will have different premises about inclusion and the diversity of the country. Australia is a very different place from the small, frightened country of just 7.2 million people in the 1940s. It is now much larger, more populous and far more diverse, with all our citizens rightly demanding to be heard and to be valued. But Australia is, again, a frightened country. 
Many of our fellow citizens are dismayed by the changes that have occurred. The loss of jobs, the size and composition of our immigrant population, the impact of technological change. These fears are driving many people to the fringes of politics as our leaders fail or are unable to understand and manage the pace of change in modern Australia. This is another urgent reason why we need reconstruction. The third reason why I think the post-war reconstruction model is still relevant is that the work was conducted and policies implemented while the business of government went on. Indeed, they did so during the most difficult years of the Second World War, when Australia was under attack, rationing and civil conscription were in place, and the entire society was in a state not just of tremendous upheaval, but in fear for its very survival. Today's disruption barely compares with that inflicted by the war, but we feel it nevertheless, and we have to deal with it and find ways to reconstruct and reform while continuing to manage the day-to-day -day economy and affairs of state. Now, I've only been able to give you the barest outline of why I think we need reconstruction and how it might happen, but I would like to give two specific examples of how we might go about starting the process of a values or principles-driven approach to policy making and change. First is the Uluru Statement from the Heart, released on May 26 this year by the Reconciliation Council, that sets out the principles of sovereignty that would form the basis of a genuine reconciliation between all Australians. That statement can and should guide the specific policy steps that are needed to achieve this. My second example is far more detailed, and I'd like to conclude tonight by taking you through the Women's Manifesto, which is a document which I have written and which I released on March the 8th, which is International Women's Day this year. Now, the Women's Manifesto does not have the endorsement um, of a wide community in the way the Uluru Statement does, but the many audiences to whom I've presented it since its launch have responded with approval and acclaim. So I present it as a policy tool in its own right, but also as a template for other areas of policy. I should also add the caution that because it was written as a manifesto rather than just as a policy document, it's written in the language of advocacy rather than boring bureaucraties. Um, I could have translated it, but I decided it was not necessary because the felt need for change is as legitimate a driver as anything else, I think. Hope you think too. The manifesto lays out four principles of women's equality. Firstly, financial self-sufficiency. Secondly, reproductive freedom. Thirdly, freedom from violence. And fourthly, the right of women to participate fully and equally in all areas of public life. Now, I contend that everything that is needed in order for women to have full equality can be subsumed within these four basic principles. Policies, of course, are needed to implement them. And I have summarised these as follows. Number one, financial self-sufficiency, which I define as um, having enough money or the means to earn it to not have to rely on anyone else to survive and thrive. In order to be self financially self-sufficient and therefore not dependent on a husband or other person to provide the basics of life or to have the option of leaving a relationship that isn't working, girls need 12 years of school education that is equal to boys. Girls and young women must then have the same opportunities as boys and young men to enter post-school education at university or technical college. They must be free to study all and any subjects and be encouraged to test themselves and branch out from areas that traditionally have attracted more women than men. If they wish, women should be able to pursue postgraduate education and be able to combine that with having a family if that is their choice. Women need to have the same employment opportunities and conditions as men, including full-time employment. Women must receive equal pay and equal opportunities for promotion, for training opportunities and the other benefits of their place of employment. Women must be free from sexual harassment and pregnancy discrimination. Childcare must be available, uh, flexible, affordable and shared between all parents. Women must have the right to keep their jobs while pregnant and get paid parental leave when they take time off from their jobs to have the baby. Women must receive superannuation, including while on paid parental leave, and if necessary, receive top-ups either from government or employers 
during their working life to ensure they have adequate retirement incomes. So in other words, each of these principles and the policy that it outlines has a number of things hanging off it which are designed to help achieve the, the principle. The second one being reproductive freedom, and that is the ability to determine when and if to have children. This is achieved by all women having access to effective and affordable contraception backed up by safe, legal and affordable abortion. Women must have access to health services, including screening and care for female specific conditions such as breast, ovarian, cervical cancer and other services needed to ensure sexual health. Women also need to be able to secure pre and postnatal care for their maternal health and that of their baby. The third principle is freedom from violence. Our bodies and our minds must be our own. Women must be safe from rape and other forms of sexual assault and must have the right to be believed and their complaint taken seriously if they suffer an, account, an attack. <coughs> Women must have access to laws that adequately address all crimes of violence and legal services that enable them to seek advice and legal redress if they choose. Women must be free from domestic and family violence of all kinds, physical, psychological, financial, and any other type of controlling and domineering behaviour on the part of a family member or intimate partner. Where needed, women must have ready access to emergency crisis services, including women's refuges, in order to be safe from violence or other threats. And finally, the fourth principle is equal representation and participation in public life. We should be part of all decision making in our society. And this means that women should participate in all areas of our society's public and economic life must be represented fully and fairly at every level of government, including the public service, in the companies that make up our economy, the not-for-profit sector, arts organisations, trade unions, the military, and yes, the churches. Now, this is a deceptively simple agenda. I'd like to say that it is simple, but it will not be easy. So it's simple, but hard. It won't be easy to achieve them. Every single aspect requires laws, policies, programs, or other elements to make each goal realisable. So it's simple, but not easy. Now to show how the principles of the manifesto can be realised, I've drawn up four specific policies, one from each of the four principles, and I recommend that these four reforms be implemented by 2022. And I've chosen that year because that marks 50 years since the election of the Whitlam government, the first government of Australia to commit to women's equality as a national policy objective. Implementation of these four policies would in itself represent progress in achieving the principles of women's equality. In addition, they would lay down markers for the full equality that would result from implementing the Women's Manifesto, manifesto in its entirety. These four specific policies are, I'll just say what they are and then quickly explain them. Number one, and this is, goes to financial self-sufficiency, legislated equal pay for all women in all jobs. Number two, the decriminalisation of abortion in New South Wales and Queensland. Three, specialist domestic violence courts in every state of Australia. And number four, gender quotas dictating that women make up 50% of all parliamentarians, all cabinets and other ministries and directors of all public company and government boards. So let me just quickly spell them out. Legislated equal pay. Um, which, as I said, is part of financial self-sufficiency. It's unconscionable that in 2017, Australian women still earn on average 20% less than men. In some jobs and in some industries, the gender pay is considerably greater. Now, as Mary Gordon, the first woman to sit on the High Court of Australia, famously said in 1979, she said, equal pay was won in 1969, won again in 1972, and yet again in 1974. But she said, we still don't have it. Now, it's 43 years since women first won equal pay. It's 37 years since Mary Gordon, Gordon pointed out that women still don't have it. The industrial court system has failed to deliver. So it is now up to the federal government, uh, federal parliament, to legislate mandating equal pay for all women in all jobs. The leader of the opposition has said he is prepared to legislate to restore penalty rates abolished by the Fair Work Commission. If he can do it for fair, if he can do it for penalty rates, he can do it for equal pay. So could the government. It is constitutionally possible. All it needs is political will. 
Second principle, and this goes to um, uh, reproductive, self reproductive control, decriminalisation of abortion in New South Wales and Queensland. Every other Australian state and territory has decriminalised abortion, including Victoria, congratulations. It's time for New South Wales and Queensland to do the same. Thirdly, uh, specialist domestic violence courts in every state. Now this is already happening in Queensland as a result of recommendations made by the Task Force on Domestic and Family Violence, headed by Quentin Bryce in 2014-2015. Following the successful trialling of such a court in Southport during 2015, the Queensland Premier um, made the commitment to create four other centres in major, four other courts in major centres across the state, and they have now all opened. Such specialist courts can provide expert handling of domestic violence cases, as well as shining a spotlight on the extent and severity of such violence across Australia. And finally, gender quotas dictating that women make up 50% of all parliamentarians, cabinet and other ministers, ministries, and directors of public companies and government boards. Now, it's clear that increased representation of women in all decision-making organisations of our society is not going to happen organically. If so, it, or, or it would already have happened. Women have been graduating from universities in Australia in greater numbers than men since the 1980s. So there is no case to be made that women continue to lack merit or experience. Were merit the sole basis for appointments, women would already outnumber men. <laughs> Affirmative action in the form of quotas, planning in other words, is the only way to ensure that the best talent available leads organisations. And to do so means including the group that makes up just over 50% of the population. Now, if this were the federal parliament, I would conclude by saying I commend the bill to the house. But of course, we're at a lecture, um, not sitting in a deliberative forum, perhaps more's the pity. So I'll finish simply by saying that I appreciate the opportunity to lay out some ideas to help us grapple with and solve the problems facing Australia. I hope they are ideas of which Ken Meyer would approve. I'm sure he would support the notion of putting them forward. And as I hope I have outlined, major social change does not happen by itself. We need to entrust competent and selfless people to design it, meticulously and in line with our values, in order to create the kind of society we want. We need to do it, we've done it before, and I sincerely hope we can do it again. Thank you.